So with me, of course, the indomitable James Healy. Uh, thanks for joining me, James. I appreciate it, man. No, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. So tell me, you know, we usually start these by really starting like early, early. So I want you to remember uh, James, the high schooler, who probably looked more or less exactly like you do now, you handsome man, you, but maybe with a little less gray in the beard. Uh, did James, like, did you know it was behavior? What If I had asked you in high school, what are you going to do? What do you think it was? It's a great question. Um, it was a couple of years ago now. Um <laughs> Just a couple. I, I think, I, and, I, and I'm conscious that I'm telling this story, as always, from my current vantage point, sort of knowing <laughs> knowing how it ends. I've always been fascinated by humans. In And that has taken, that has taken many forms. Um, in high school, I loved history. History was kind of my subject. Mm. Um History has a sort of interesting connection to behavioral science as I see it, because so much of history, so much of a study of history is essentially trying to figure out why people did things. Yes. And a lot of the time it involves a, a sort of assumption about the way that people behave, the way that people act. Um, my favorite example of this, and I mean, why, why don't we go straight here, is dictators the number of times in in history you end up having a conversation or or, or writing an essay or, or doing some research to try and understand you know why did hitler invade the soviet union why did stalin you know come up with the gulag and essentially you end up trying to rationalize the totally irrational and trying to explain well why why did why did he do this lunatic thing and i say he it's usually he and sort of implicit in that is a whole set of assumptions about the way that humans behave, about sort of human rationality. There must be some rational, some rational explanation for this, what is on the surface totally irrational thing that happened. Mm -hmm. If I sort of fast forward a bit from there, I decided not to study history i decided to study philosophy and economics yeah now, you, you you went to lse which is not famous for its history program uh in the same way that it's sort of like is famous for sort of its economics what why econ and philosophy like where did that pip do you was it like a, a gradual bend and an abrupt left turn like what happened so i i began studying economics in high school for what we call in the uk a levels so that's your last two years of, of high school and I loved economics. And what I loved about economics was essentially trying to understand why things happen, trying to understand the way that the world is, trying to understand, I guess, trying to link sort of some of the, the great thinkers in, in economic history to the reality of the world today or, or as it was then. Mm -hmm. And that sort of led me more and more into philosophy. And... I don't want to study straight philosophy. I mean, you know, what do philosophers do? What do philosophers do with their lives? They leave university and smoke pot and sit in rooms and yeah, they never make anything of their lives. So I'll study philosophy and econ together. That'll give me a blend of stuff that I'm interested in, but also perhaps some prospect of gainful future employment as well. Mm. And because I studied economics at high school, I actually found first year economics very easy. And I was probably a bit of a pain in the ass for the uh, for my tutor, which was reflected in the fact that about two thirds of the way through that year, he took me on one side and said, I think perhaps with slightly more glee than was necessary, I just want you to be aware you're going to sail through first year economics, you're going to ace that, and you're going to, and you're going to fail second and third year economics. Really? There's a bold yeah. statement for a t professor to come and sort of be like, all right, man. And 
the reason for that, as he explained to me, was he knew from the way that I was answering things, from the way that I was you know, talking in class, I was thinking about why people did things. I was thinking about people's behavior. What I was not thinking about was the equations and the graphs. And he was a very astute man because I was not thinking about those things because those are not my those are not my thing. Mm -hmm. uh, that's not how I think about the world. I'm not a mathematician. And as if to demonstrate his point, I did very well in that first year economics class. Absolutely flunked the maths class. Like got a stratospherically low score in that, which I knew was going to happen. Uh, and as a result, we all came to the uh, the conclusion that he'd already come to. Economics isn't for me. I'm going to study philosophy. One of the fascinating things that we hear over and over again in these interviews is precisely that. A lot of people have these moments where someone older and wiser recognizes that they're in the wrong field, right? So, for example, like when I went off to you know, I was preparing to accept my grad school, uh, PhD sort of acceptances. Um, uh, uh, Tom from Cornell was like, you keep talking about applied. And I just want to be clear, like, we don't, we don't do that. We're scholars, like we study, but we don't change, right? We don't, our, we're not designed to change the system. We're designed to study the system. And, you know, I couldn't, I was like, oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Like off to PhD, I go. He was Absolutely right. And we have heard that in interview after interview where someone within the discipline who's doing that thing says, not in an unkind way, not in a, not usually, not usually in an unkind way, like, hey, get the hell out of my discipline, but rather, hey, you, you might not, this might not be your thing, like based on your reaction to this, even though you're very certain it is, I am equally certain that you are wrong. <laughs> so why, so you come to this realization after after the tutor and after you have some time to fail some math. So you get some evidence, you accept no opinion, you go get some evidence, which is that you fail some math. And then why philosophy? Because that was what I was already studying. Um, the philosophy program at LSE is, is great. Um, it essentially meant I could just continue on without, without having to do another year, without having to totally change tack. And one of the benefits of doing just a straight philosophy degree was it meant I had suddenly a whole load of optional courses opened up. When you're doing a dual honors, kind of everything's, you know, you're, laid you're out. Taking you the, this, you're this, taking this. the set, the gas. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I did a, I, I did a history course. I did a social anthropology course. Did you take any psych? So, no, not formally. But, but many i'm not gonna say all my my philosophical interests sort of went in in two parallel directions one the sort of political philosophy the, the you know the history of western philosophy plato through aristotle yeah all the way through to sort of marx that was one angle the other angle was the angle of or, or that part of philosophy that sort of veers inexorably into neuroscience so consciousness so you know dan zenit the stuff that that now people like anil seth talk about mm. um the other angle and the lse philosophy department pushes this very hard because Karl popper was kind of the, the founder of the lse philosophy school is philosophy of science and i studied this elective his history of scientific revolutions and it was basically, starting with Copernicus, those pivot points in the history of science when the status quo, the accepted, you know, received wisdom was turned on its head. Hmm. You know, Copernicus, Galileo, Kepler, Darwin. And towards the end of this, there was this whole section on these two weird Israeli psychologists and at the time, I was like, why Why are these guys, like, I'm sorry, these guys are not in the same category 
They are no <laughs> Copernicus. Danny Kahneman is no Copernicus. Exactly. And so, you know, read a couple of the, the foundational papers that Kahneman and Tversky had written. And suddenly I've now come full circle because having been, you know, I won't say kicked out, but having been politely, <laughs> politely ejected from the economic school because I, I think too much about the way that people behave. Suddenly I'm, I'm reading these two kind of renegades who are really focused on the way that people behave and who, you know what, are casting a bit of doubt on all that mathematical stuff that's being taught over in the econ department. Mm -hmm. Now, it's interesting, though, if you read there, I mean, they are very much, I, I think the social psychologists, we all really want to claim them. Some of those papers are very, I mean, there are a lot of equations in those papers, man. They are very much like, econ you know, you read that next to a typical social psych paper and you're like, this is an economics Whoa. paper, <laughs> right? Yeah. But to your point, it's interesting. This is such a great point about framing and sort of cycle and sort of scientific revolutions, because, you know, to us, we're looking at it going, that is definitely economics. And the economics guys are going, nope. Like, I don't know what you're doing just because of having an equation. Like, you know, you <laughs> It's a weird stuff happening here. Uh, and, you know, that's where that conflict comes from is, you know, there's no inbuilt discipline where people are like, oh, yeah, this makes total sense that you would do this thing uh, until you make it. But it. It's funny, right? And it, it speaks to a, a sort of deeper truth of human nature. We, we categorize things. We automatically categorize things. That's particularly true in academia. There's a great quote from Kissinger that I can never quite remember, but it, it's it's something about, you know, basically the, the the reason that conflicts in academia are so poisonous is because the stakes are so small and it comes down to people fighting over you know is it in in this category is it in that category yeah and, and one of the things i've noticed through my through my career to be honest is that people spend a lot of time worrying about which category they're in people try very hard to fit in Actually, there's a, a lot of opportunity at the boundaries between categories. There's a lot of opportunity from not quite fitting in. Because all the opportunities that sit firmly within categories, someone within those categories has already taken them. Someone has already solved the problem. If, if, if there's a huge challenge that sits squarely within someone's remit, they've probably dealt with it because they can because it's within their remit. The really interesting challenges are at the boundaries. They're at the borders between things in the gray areas. Yeah, for sure. Well, and particularly for social psych, you know, in applied behavioral science, you know, when you move out of academia, right, into the applied world, I just care that it works, right? You can call it, I had an interesting discussion today with a client where, where they were like, do you call this behavioral science or do you call it human-centered design? I said, I don't care. You can call it anything you want. You can call it schmooly boogly as long as it is behavior as an outcome and science as a process, I literally don't care what you call it. And she found that very freeing. And I, you know, and that's to your point, you know, in, a, in academic disciplines, there are tomes about is this human centered design or is this behavioral science, you know, like tomes where we're about, you know, what we should call a thing. And the beautiful thing about applied part is as long as it works, right? Like moving on. So now you're, you're over here in the philosophy thing. You take this interesting, you're, you're at least now been exposed. It's interesting to me in the economics, even in first year economics, I guess we should put this in time here. You know, this is 2000, 2001, you know, it's kind of in Tursky. You haven't yet won a Nobel prize and are super famous for doing this thing. So there's a reason maybe now in intro psych or intro uh, economics, you might get some of the yep. stuff that you didn't get. So you're over here in philosophy. You've now learned about, Connor and Tversky, but like you're sort of cruising through philosophy, you go straight into a master's program. To do international history. Yes. <laughs> so tell me about, so it's not like, you know, sometimes this is an interesting difference. You know, some of our guests, they have the revelation and then it's from then on, it's the thing. And some people get exposed and then it takes some time before they sort of come to that as a thing that they that they want to do. It sounds like you're more in the latter quarter. You're sort of getting this exposure, but it's not like, and now I will do behavioral science. Correct. And I, I always find it funny when I'm 
I asked as, as everyone is, you know, talk me through your career. Tell tell me your your career story. And it is very much a story. And essentially a career, I I think, is in some respects a story that we construct retrospectively to explain choices which may have occurred for a variety of reasons. So I, I could try really hard to come up with a, a sort of rationalization for, for why I took that route. I think the honest answer is I wanted to do another year of study. I wanted to do a master's to differentiate myself a little bit. In the UK at that point, it was still a little bit differentiating to go to grad school. And I was really interested in history. And essentially, it was a free hit. So I did this program, Masters of History of International Relations, is, is what it was formally called. It was essentially 20th century global history. Uh, so I had a big focus on US 20th century foreign policy and also a big focus on the Middle East, which was a, another sort of passion area of mine. And then you graduate and? So it's funny, LSE has this global reputation and depending sort of what you do and where you sit in the world, it has a very different global reputation. So there's a lot of people who know of LSE as this kind of hotbed of 60s counterculture, sort of left-wing radicalism. So it, yeah. It was essentially the Berkeley of, of of UK academia for a long time. And, you know, in the in the 60s, they were burning things, they were having sit-ins, they were, you know, doing all that stuff. That kind of left-wing current is still there. And there are all kinds of, you know, radical protest groups on campus. A lot of people leave LSE and and take a, you know, kind of take that route, right? A huge proportion of people also go straight into finance or law and make lots of money. You uh, no wait, hold on. I, Before we talk about which one you did, if you went back now, do you think you could pick who, you know, is there a sorting hat? Is it clear who's gonna go each direction? Or do you think graduation happens and then and then magically some assort one direction to magically some assort the other direction? I, I I'd say it's 80-20 rule. Um, so there are some people who are like, they are here because their aim is to go work at Goldman Sachs. A couple of my very good friends fit into that category. They have done that very successfully. Equally, the firebrand radical leader of the Socialist Worker Party on campus, who, you know, was out there leading the anti-capitalist movement, he also had a very successful career at Goldman Sachs. Uh, I would, I would love to love to talk to him about how that played out. Uh, cognitive dissonance, right there. Some people, it's very predictable. Others, others, it's not. And so, do you? If you now, so this was a leading question. If you went back and looked at Baby James, would you have known that Baby James is going to go to Deutsche Bank? No, um, and I'm sure a bunch of my my close friends, uh, if they're listening to this at some point, will be chuckling away because um, they've given me a lot of shit over the years for you know that that level of. Uh... <laughs> I, I hesitate to use the word hypocrisy, but uh, I was very sure that I was not going to do that. And then you know, as you get towards the end of the university, that sort of uncomfortable economic reality of mm, I now need to do something. So yeah, I, I then spent 14 or 15 years in, in big banks and doing various things, started off in, in pretty menial kind of back office processing type roles, ended up spending a long period of time sitting on sitting on the trading floor. And the way I always describe this is if you're interested in human behavior, the trading floor is the equivalent of the Maasai Mara or the Serengeti for people who are interested in animals. It's like, this is, this is humans and human behavior 
kind of in its most elemental form. Nature red in tooth and claw. Correct. It it is also home to this really interesting sort of real life demonstration of the of the the, the paradox within economics. Because you have all of these people who speak this language, I'm talking here about traders, right? They they speak this language of pure economics. They try to live and act in this purely rational way. And some of them are exceedingly smart. All of them are exceedingly smart, to be honest, just in different ways. But they they talk this language they almost try and personify that purely rational economic man seemingly oblivious of the fact that if they were rational they wouldn't have a job because if everyone were acting rationally there wouldn't be any price differentials to make money of the that's markets right. would be efficient that's right they would be they a perfectly be. efficient market like things would be valued at exactly the value that they you know Right. Whatever their current, you know, plus some handy, you know, there has to be, we have to have differences of opinion. The whole market is based on differences of opinion. Correct. And this is, you know, I think this is interesting at any point in time. It's particularly interesting if you happen through pure happenstance to uh, be on a trading floor through 2007, 2008, 2009. And essentially have a front row seat for the sort of once in a generation collapse of financial markets. And I've always found it fascinating sort of the, the disconnect between the way that this is perceived popularly, the way that it's described in the media as essentially a bunch of reckless cowboys who, through their own greed and devil may care attitude took on vast amounts of risk and blew up the world whereas in reality the fatal flaw was not that they were taking on huge amounts of risk willingly and carelessly it was that so many of them believed so much in the models that they actually didn't think they were taking on much risk at all and if you think about the sort of caricatures of people on trading floors, there's a range of, of different archetypes. And again, this was in London, right? And it'd be slightly different in New York, it'd be slightly different in, in Asia. But you've sort of got at one end of the spectrum, the, the Cockney wide boys, the guys who left school at 16 have worked their way up. They're really street smart. They've got that Cockney accent that I won't attempt to do right now. They're the ones that are seen as, you know, they're, they're kind of devil may care, caution to the wind guys. It wasn't them, nor was it the public school boys, the, uh, you know, the, the old Etonians with the, the network. The, re the really dangerous ones were the really quiet nerdy guys with a PhD in applied statistics from the Sorbonne because they were the ones who built essentially the spreadsheet that purported to model human behavior in a thousand variables that no one else could really understand. I have a friend who often describes it as, uh, to your point, I like history and I like the way that history and psychology interact. You know, when COVID first uh, came about, you know, a bunch of governments called me and said, hey, how do we keep people inside? And I said, well, you know, we've never really done that before from a psychology perspective. So I don't know that we have any particular answers from our discipline, but you can sure look at history because history has kept people in, you know, we talked about, I uh, uh, introduced a, uh, a friend who's an historian of sort of World War II London. And she was talking about sort of like, why did, why did people obey or not obey bombing, you know, sirens? And she, you know, she, we know a lot about why this sort of, you know, people did the, you know, they broke out for very specific, you know, when people didn't obey, they didn't obey for very specific reasons. And like, here are the sets of things. And it turns out, hey, if we, the same things that people did for COVID, right? You know, 
And so uh, this particular moment in history that you're talking about this, you know, a friend of mine likens it to the moment where people became disaggregated from agriculture. So you go from people understanding how food happens and growing happens. And then, you know, because of mass agriculture in not a whole lot of time, suddenly there's a whole generation of people who don't really understand how things are grown kind of at all. Right. Yep. But they're still reliant on that thing. Right. And so when all these models happened, you know, your street smart cockney guys actually had a fairly good understanding of, you know, the underlying things. But suddenly, you know, in a generational shift, they got one step, they got disaggregated by the model. And so, and, you know, suddenly you get monocultures and all the weird, crazy things that happen when you disaggregate your food supply. Um, it is, re to your point, it's a fascinating sort of, and what's, uh, you know, the movie, The Big Short. I said, yes, right. Very familiar. It's interesting to watch how how your archetypes play out. You know, one of the people was like, "I recognize the flaw in the model," right? Extraordinarily geeky to the point of almost autism. I recognize yes. the flaw in the model, right? Different thing that is, you know, there's that wonderful scene where the guy's like, "How do you know the model's flawed?" And they like point at the Asian guy and are like, "Because he said so." I don't know why. I have no understanding of what's actually happening. But this guy, who is smart and I trust, has recognized a flaw, right? And you can see that disaggregation and that bet on a disaggregation. What an interesting... So wait, you're like, we got to break your finance career down, though, because you sort of start commodities analyst and then, you know, you're on you're on the floor for a long time across three different, you know, sort of you know, very short time at, at Deutsche and then at Credit Suisse, and then you were at Standard Chartered for a bit. And then all of a sudden you're the director of human capital consulting at, at Deloitte. So, so let's fast forward through the Deutsche Bank and Credit Suisse years. What is happening at Standard Chartered Bank that you're like, hey, you know what? I am going to. <laughs> so I had various roles at Credit Suisse. Uh, I moved continents. I moved from London to Singapore. Um, the crisis happened. Obviously, after the crisis, there was this explosion in regulation and essentially attempts to, this will never happen again. And one of the big parts of that, and this is one of those sort of fascinating, but not particularly well-known areas of finance, uh, something called recovery and resolution planning. Now, this is categorized in the media to the extent that it's ever in the media at all. It's categorized as living wills for banks. So it is essentially an attempt to it is an it is an attempt to answer the question that a bunch of senior bank execs had a weekend to answer in September 2008. So the way that the story of Lehman Brothers played out, everyone went into a room uh at one of the banks in New York, I forget which one, was you know the the CEOs of all the big Wall Street banks, all the big global banks, a bunch of guys from the you know the New York Fed and the Fed. Basically, Lehman Brothers is cooked. It's going down on Monday, and by the way, Monday means Monday Sydney time when the markets open there. So basically, Sunday night. So guys, how do we? essentially bankrupt Lehman Brothers in 40 hours without blowing up the world economy. Eight years later, they were still, still trying to unwind Lehman Brothers. There was still a rump of Lehman Brothers, you know, trading positions, etc. So I think it's fair to say that they didn't do a particularly great job over that weekend. It was now, a weekend, to be fair. I'm not throwing any shade at them because it was an impossible task. So this thing called recovery and resolution planning was essentially forcing the, the 30 biggest banks in the world to uh, do that planning in advance. So rather than let's wait, let's wait till the rainy day to fix the roof, let's fix the roof now. And so let's understand, let's map at a very detailed level, how the bank actually works, how the different subsidiaries, how the different businesses, how the different systems, how it all hangs together. And kind of implicit in this regulation was, by the way, when you start doing this, what you will find is 
it's hideously complicated. Your bank is too big to understand. It's certainly too big to fail safely. So therefore, as you do this, you you will be forced to simplify, to reorganize, to, you know. And so I, I ended up doing a piece of work at Credit Suisse around this, and I found it absolutely fascinating. It was structural reform of the banking industry. And Wait, one day I get a call. Hold up, because we got to do good storytelling here. You put your hand up for this? Like someone goes, ah, James is pretty good with people, and we're going to make him do that? Like, how does that happen? Yeah, just kind of, yeah, I was in a, I was in a, an internal projects team and th this project came up and I was, you know, it was kind of right place, right time. I was available for an internal consulting team effectively. Uh, I was kind of the right guy to do that. I was available. You just can weigh up which out. one of those was, was more important. Yeah. There's a lot of luck, a lot of luck and timing. Got it. And so I did this for a bit um, at, at Credit Suisse, um, but I was very much on the periphery because Credit Suisse, as the name suggests, headquarters in Zurich. I was in Singapore at the time. We were a bit of an appendage. And I then got a call out of the blue from a recruiter who I knew pretty well because he'd hired a lot of people for me over the years. And he was like, hey, I, I, look, I'm actually just calling for your advice because I've got this weird role at standard chart and i don't really understand what it is like it, are you kind of familiar with with this now he claims that this was a genuine call it wasn't a setup i still don't know because my response to it was well yeah i know exactly what that is because that's that's what i've been doing for the last year and silence and he's like really <laughs> And so, yeah, I was one of very few people in Singapore, frankly, who knew what this was. And by process of elimination, ended up getting this job, leading this for Standard Chartered. Standard Chartered is a British bank, but it is essentially de facto headquartered in Singapore. They have, you know, kind of token headquarters in, in London, but all the operations are in Asia and Africa. And global role opportunity to do this really fascinating really important thing work with regulators across the globe work with all of these fascinating and different countries i mean standard chartered is the sole bank in the falkland islands it is the biggest bank in places like zambia or nepal like there is just a, a level of interest in working for an organization that you know, is in these weird and wonderful geographies, kind of the challenges they have to deal with. And so you suddenly you're working very cross-culturally, right? Very different sets of, you know, promoting and inhibiting pressures for all of these different cultures and how they even treat banking. I mean, I think people in the West often treat banking somewhat as a commodity, but that's not the relationship that everybody has with their bank across the world, right? Uh and so you're trying to bring all these people together to sort of get to a, a unified solution with very, very different sets of needs and, and competing desires. It, correct. And just very different situations in each market. I mean, you know, anyone who's anyone who project any level will be familiar with, you know, a raid log, right? Like tracking risks and issues. I still remember the point we had to add a, an issue in our raid log uh about sierra leone because um they called to tell us there was a massive ebola outbreak uh and so they weren't going to be able to hit the deadlines which we'd mandated for them to hit and it's like what's our mitigation for this guys and it's like solving ebola is slightly above all of our pay grades come on james you can do it i believe in you Failure of imagination on my part, I'm sure. I'm um, looking. So I did that, loved it. The great team had a lot of fun. Did this really important, somewhat you know, underappreciated work, and that kind of came to an end. It was a natural sort of decision point. We've been in Singapore for seven years. Uh, we decided to move to Australia, which is which is where my wife's from. 
and we were moving to Perth, which is not a banking town, and that was kind of fine with me. I need to do something different. So I you knew you knew at this, change. You knew at this point you needed change. You knew at this point, hey, like kind of my era in finance, or at least this kind of finance is over. I'm going to pick my head up. I'm going to look for something different. I'm going to look at something different. Correct. And one of the things I'll say is throughout my finance career, you know, I had continued an interest in behavioral science, in all of those those things that we've talked about, history as well. But And I had been for years sort of subtly bringing in little techniques that we would now call applied behavioral science. Um, one of the stories I always tell about that time at Standard Chartered is the use of gamification. So without going into the details, we need a bunch of people in all of these countries to do something fairly menial and administrative outside of their day jobs. And surprise, surprise, it was really hard to get them to do it. Until one day, we decided to gamify it. And so every week, every Thursday, and it was every Thursday to accommodate the different weekend in the Middle East, I would send an email to country CEOs, like these are people running, you know, tens, hundreds of billion dollar businesses, right? They're way above, way above my pay grade. And I would send them this league table of where their country sat versus all the other countries. And within about half an hour, I would be CC'd on dozens of emails from these country CEOs to their leadership teams saying things like, why are we behind South Africa? I, I demand that we overtake India next week, you know, Pakistan. Um, th this kind of <laughs> very competitive, very driven people at that senior level who should have much better things to do than respond to my emails. Don't don't want to lose to the South African head. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And yeah, it's a really it's a really funny example, but I had been using these little behavioral science techniques for a long time. Anyway, moved to Australia, introduced to Deloitte by a friend of mine. I'd kind of been in this internal consulting role at Credit Suisse for a while. So, you know, had some idea of what I was getting into. Uh, joined Human Capital, which is, as the name half suggests, all about humans. And Wait. very early on, sorry. Wait, hold on. You're skipping past a point in the story that's very important. Were you, when you started talking to Deloitte, were you like, this is it? Or were there other things that sort of were pulling you in different directions and, and there was a choice choice moment here? Or were you um, like human capital? Hey, I get to I get to sort of do this kind of thing that I've now been fascinated with since a very long time, and I've been applying in all these finance settings. But I get to do it sort of twenty four seven. Yeah, there, there there were a couple of other things, but fairly early on, this was this was the main thing, and um, I guess the behavioral science part of it, which I think I talked about in my interview. Um, in fact, actually, I think my interview, my original interview was in the very room I'm sitting in now, which is uh, which is interesting. Um, shortly after I joined, behavioral science became a focus area. It was suddenly in that way that big organizations often have, you know, I think it was it was becoming a thing in the market and someone else had some well-publicized success in this area, one of our competitors, and it was, hey, you know, we need to get into this. And I was like, me, 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 me. <laughs> and yeah, I would love to say that there was an immediate recognition of my inherent genius uh, and that I was the absolutely perfect person to do this. I suspect it was more that I was just annoying. Me, 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 and eventually, fine, you. And so then, then we began, and the remit that I was given, and I always laugh about this, the remit I was given was totally impossible. It was maintain the academic rigor while making this commercially viable and applicable by as many people as possible. Uh, which, of course, is you know an impossible freeway balancing act. 
Yes, particularly because that's not really what academia is particularly designed well to do. Uh, right, it's not to do, you know, Tom Gelovich calling me, you know, hey, what is, no, this is not, well, you know, application is not. It's interesting that people, I think people underappreciate that that's actually by design. Meaning I think people look at it and are like, oh, those weird scientists, they're like, those weird scholars are doing their scholarly thing and being obstinate. I'm like, no, like they, in order to study a system, you have to deliberately divorce. You can't start changing things in the system. That's not how, you, know, you can't do that, right? At that, at that, you know, at that sort of when you're trying to find generalizable knowledge, right? Changing things in the system is not how you find generalizable knowledge. Correct. Uh, it's how you make things happen within a system for sure. But uh, so you're given an impossible task. How did you, how are you communicating back to people that this is impossible? How are you trying to make it work? Like, you know, tell us a little bit about that, that upward communicate, you know, uh, I love the, I got my job by being annoying. I think a lot of behavioral scientists get their job by being annoying because, you know, you see something that other people don't see. Right. You know, at that to your point very, very early on about, you know, the interesting stuff being at the margins, the margins require convincing. Right. If this was self-evident, we'd be doing it already. Yeah. Right. Uh, which I think a lot of young people, a lot of young behavioral scientists wish it was self-evident. They're like, I wish it was self-evident so that I could just like not. I'm like, that is not where we are. We are over here and it's going to require convincing and you're going to have to explain what it is over and over. And that's particularly the case, given what what I've tried to do and, and what we've done here, which is take a, a discipline or a set of techniques that has been fairly well proven and fairly well applied in various guises to changing consumer behavior and citizen behavior, right? You know, whether or not they knew it was behavioral science, marketing and advertising departments have been doing this organically for decades, right? Behavioral science almost retrospectively explained why they were doing it and why it was working. Obviously, then, you know, the behavioral insights team, 2010, I'm sure everyone listening to this is, is, is well aware of, of, of that history. It's been largely focused on consumers and citizens. Yeah. The whole thing, my whole thing, has been hey, guys, employees are humans too. Why does the HR department not talk to the marketing department? Hey, how are you influencing people? Maybe we could borrow some of this stuff. So my my whole shtick, I guess, is, hey, HR, listen to marketing. They've got some ideas. Here are some techniques. Here are some new ways of doing things that have been proven practically, not just academically, but in practice to change consumer and, and citizen behavior. Why don't we try some of those things internally with employees? I have a pet theory and I want your reaction to it. So I have a pet theory that is one of the reasons that HR had struggled to do this or struggles to do this is because of their belief about rationality, right? HR folks a little bit like doctors, right? Doctors are often be like, we make this pill, it saves your life. You'll take the pill because you don't want to die. Actually, nobody takes the pill because the pill is huge and terrible and it's annoying to take it every day and it, you know, tastes of bitter chemicals and like all sorts of things that, you know, doctors are like, but you'll die. And people are like, yeah, I hear you, man. But like, it's a really bad pill. HR is sort of like, this benefit is good for you. It's good. This is, I can make a mathematical model that says this is like economically good for you. Surely you will enroll in this benefit because it is economically like rationally good for you. And it's very hard to step away from that lens and go, it would sell people on this. <laughs> I totally agree. And I think it's, it's you know, I, I always focus on HR. It's not just HR, right? It's compliance. It's, you know, anyone on this call who's worked in any organization of any scale will have spent interminable hours on mandatory e-learnings for various things. It's this wonderful sort of, I use the phrase again, cognitive dissonance. Or, or everybody, everybody knows that this doesn't work. Everybody. But yet we all 
sign up to to this sort of shared falsehood, this shared belief. Yeah, yeah. Well, if we if we put out an e-learning, then then the thing then will people will comply, and I will compete with James to make sure that my thing gets into the e-learning ahead of his thing because we're so convinced that my that my thing is so important it must have its e-learning class, even though. I have never watched an e-learning thing. I just click the button and put things on mute. To, you know, like no one actually does this. Correct. And I guess it's a question I now ask a lot of clients is, do you want to do something that will really work? Or do you want to do something? Motion and by the way, yeah, by the way, there's no judgment in that. In that question, sometimes just doing something is kind of what you want to do. It's kind of enough. You want to demonstrate we've taken this seriously. We have done something. But the answer to that question, it really goes to the crux of a lot of this. So much of what is done in big organizations and in society, frankly, by, by governments is performative. Everyone kind of knows in their heart of hearts it's not going to work. It's not actually going to move the dial. But it's the accepted thing that kind of we're socially permitted to do about this. It, it's like that old adage, no one ever got fired for hiring IBM. Now, no disrespect to IBM. Is that... So there's two interpretations and they both might be present. Do you think that's because of social signaling? Meaning, you know, we want to gesture, you know, uh, we want to show people we're doing the accepted thing. Or do you think it's so that's sort of a promoting pressure thing, right? Hey, this is a social value to do this thing that other people are doing. Or do you think it's inhibiting pressure? It's just people sort of saying like, eh, it's hard to come up with new things. It's harder to do the thing that works. And so I'm really just optimizing for ease. Do you think it's about ease or do you think people genuinely think they're doing the right thing? I think it's both. I think it's context specific. I think it's individual specific. But there's always a risk in doing something differently. For sure. Yeah. You know? And Rory Sutherland talks a lot about this, right? You don't get fired for doing the rational thing. You don't get fired doing the obvious thing that you could make the logical case in advance would work and at the end of the day not getting fired is a you know it's a reasonable human motivation third time my poverty but not my will consents shakespeare got it right yeah what's what what the hell what's that quote i think uh, gosh, who is it from? It's difficult. It's difficult to get a man to understand something when his salary depends on not understanding it. Yes. Uh, do you think this is getting easier? So you've now been, right? You've been at Deloitte a little over five years. Congratulations, right? It was a couple, couple months ago, I think was your anniversary. Uh, you, you know, you've been banging this drum. You've been trying to do this the internal version of behavior change, right? Still applied behavior science, but internal behavior science. Over the course, you know, you've been at it long enough. Do you feel like clients are catching on and it's easier to explain to them? And and is that because they're more receptive? You're better at explaining it? Like a little bit of both? I, it, Matt, it's, it's definitely my inherent charm and genius that <laughs> is driving, driving this. No, it, what I'd say is, I feel like behavioral science is, and we were in an echo chamber, right? We were all in this. Anyone listening to this is well entrenched in the echo chamber. Very conscious of that effect. My LinkedIn feed, like yours, like everyone else's, is full of behavioral science because that's people I've connected with. That's people I follow. I've carefully cultivated the echo chamber to make sure it's the echo chamber I want. It feels to me like there is a massive growth in awareness interest understanding of this field i feel like and this is something i i actually want to test over the, the next year or so i feel like there is this kind of underground movement within organizations the number of conversations i have 
where someone will say, oh, you do that thing. Oh, I'm fascinated by that. You know, I've always wanted to try and do that here. But, you know, I think we're, we're approaching a tipping point. How long we're going to continue approaching it before we tip, I don't know. But I feel like we're approaching a tipping point where we've seeded enough people in enough organizations who speak a bit of this language, who understand a bit of this, that I'm going to sound like a crazed revolutionary here, that that sort of moment of change is coming. It's getting easier to have these conversations. We haven't yet tipped over to this being the norm. HR departments have not, you know, en masse holistically adopted more behavioral techniques. There are pockets. There are pockets here and there. But I think it's coming. I think there's far more people on the train than there were three years ago, five years ago. Do you think it will, will people call it applied behavioral science or will it be just become the accepted way of doing change management and other kinds of traditional? To, to, your, to your, your comment earlier, I don't know and I don't care. They can call it, <laughs> they can call oh, it they want. for all I care. Yeah. I, I, I think, I think, the big challenge is there will, and this is the challenge, I, I keep coming back to the language of revolution here, but it is the big, it is the big challenge that all revolutions face, the big paradox, which is success means dilution. Yeah. Success means enough people jumping on board this thing to reach that critical mass. But to do that, you have to dilute the thing. Right. Yes, one hundred percent. I mean, we, uh, we, have, we have at Beside.io have been working on a what is now something like eighty-page-long guide, trying to argue that there is not one behavioral science scientist, but six. There are six roles, right? We're talking about quants and quals and designers, and how, like, how can we look at those differently? To the level of like, what are their jobs? Here's a JD. Here's like interview questions and guides for scoring the answers to the interview because you know to your point it's hard when we're at this place where the consumers of the thing don't know enough to know if they're getting sold a false bill of goods which is a dangerous point in any movement right yeah. is, a dangerous point in any dilution is when counterfeits appear right um it is interesting you know i'm obviously not in my normal black box i'm on site with a client and at on site with client is a is the change management team from from not Deloitte but a fellow consultancy, and it was interesting to me when I got introduced to them that they immediately said, "Oh yes, I'm a big fan of behavioral science. That's a big part of what I do." Right? These are people who are in primarily organizational development, change management. Right? So they identify themselves as, "Hey, I'm an OD person." Oh yes, behavioral science is it. Whereas. 10 years ago, I don't know that I, I, I'm not sure we would have heard that in the same way. No, it was a much more exotic and niche thing. Um, and that's great. And that, that is progress. But it does also mean dilution. It does mean, you know, dilution to some extent of the rigor there's a horrible sort of bastardized version of this. I read a paper once and then I applied that paper blindly. Do you do a lot? I mean, do you spend a lot of time internally focused on sort of prolificating at Deloitte and training OD and change management and other sorts of folks in the, in the, in the discipline of the thing? Yes. And, you know, we even have an e-learning, Matt, <laughs> which is the ultimate irony. Um, well, actually, that's not the ultimate irony. The, the ultimate irony is that in an attempt to inculcate into people the understanding that telling people about something, raising their awareness about it will not change their behavior. I do that by telling them about it and raising their awareness. Yeah. Uh, well, on this call is a wonderful, you know, Lorraine... Uh, minister, our head of education is on the call. She's the one who put together our, you know, whatever it is, Lorraine, I'm going to get it wrong. Is it 10 weeks, five weeks, eight weeks? I can't remember how many weeks the training is. Uh, Lorraine's good. Six weeks, six weeks, says Lorraine. 
right? Uh, is the sort of self-guided training version. Uh, but there isn't a lot of, you know, we sort of made our own at Frog, you know, uh, we've now made this one for bside.io, but there aren't a lot of, you know, specifically human human capital sort of change management, right? So whether it's change management, OD, right? All the various applications of applied behavioral science, that's really new ground. Do you think you'll, I mean, will you make a course internal to Deloitte at some point? So look, we've, we've done a couple of things internally. Um, we did one right at the beginning and with, as with so many things, I, I go back and look at that now periodically. I was actually looking at it the other day for, for something I was working on and part of me is very proud of it and part of me cringes and goes oh my god like but that's good that right isn't that i mean isn't that a that's sign progress. that the curve is you know I, I always tell the story of you know if you read start at the end we never once say the side method because we hadn't figured out that like strategy insights design evaluation spelled side right we said it but we never went oh you could just abbreviate that you know book is what four or five years old we never say always, never, sometimes, start, and stop, which is now the default way we do research, right? You know, we look at people who always do something, never do something, sometimes do something, just started doing something, just stopped doing something. This is standard now, didn't have the faintest idea five years ago, right? Yeah. So, I mean, I think that you're at this, this point of change. James, thank you for spending an hour with me. It's always so fun to talk to you. And we got to get you back again, you know, five years from now to see if the tipping point has happened, right? You know, I think you're really you know, Deloitte and, 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 and with you at the head is, it's, you know, they're really pushing that envelope of what, you know, OD and change management and things can look like through a behavioral science lens. And, and I'm so appreciative that you sort of shared that lens with folks um, here. And, and, you know, I'll get over to your side of the pond at some point uh, now that I'm traveling a little more and uh, I'll finally, uh, you know, buy you, buy you the many beers I owe you. Uh, no, thank you for having me. And thank you everyone for listening. It's been fun. And yeah, please let me know when you're when you're down under. I'll, I'll make it happen. And you know, folks on who hear this, you know, uh, how's the best way to you know if they go, oh yes, we have these challenges internally. Like, I wish I could talk to James about it. How's the best way to get a hold of you? Social, LinkedIn, so, email, LinkedIn, LinkedIn. Um, aside from LinkedIn, I do not have any social media presence. So, uh, LinkedIn is the place to go. LinkedIn is the place to go. Uh, if you can't live without the sound of my voice, uh, I do have a podcast series. You can find that find that on Apple, Spotify. It's also on my LinkedIn. It's called The B Word. There you go. Uh, I was say, you got to say the name. Guest, <laughs> my most recent guest was uh, some guy called Matt from San Diego, um, but you don't want to listen to him. Definitely not. Uh, he's a much better interviewer than he is a guest, it turns out. Uh, thank you for spending time with me, James. Uh, uh, always a pleasure to talk, and I'll talk to you soon. See you, my friend. Thank you. Goodbye, everybody. Thanks. See you, Darren, Sam, Darren, others. Bye. Yeah.